Good morning and welcome to RUSI in London. Uh, my name is Ed Arnold. I'm a Research Fellow for European Security at RUSI. Welcome to the event today on Operation Cabrit, the British Army's contribution to defence in the Baltic States, which is part of the What the Fence Does series. Following the Russian invasion of Crimea and parts of the Donbass in 2014, NATO established the Enhanced Forward Presence in the Baltic States, designed to protect and reaffirm the security of the alliance's eastern member states. Centred in Tapa, southeast of the Estonian capital of Tallinn, the UK commands a multinational battle group augmented by a subunit from Denmark or France. Since the start of the war in Ukraine, NATO has significantly bolstered its defence and deterrence posture in the east, doubling its multinational battle groups from four to eight to be prepared to defend every inch of NATO territory as demanded by its new strategic concept. And as part of this development, a settled second battle group has been deployed to Estonia to provide further deterrence and support to the first Estonian brigade. And today we have some speakers uh, to discuss this and we're very lucky to have members of the Royal Welsh Battle Group who are currently in theatre. And speakers today we have Lieutenant Colonel Jerry Mackay, He's the operations team leader for Europe in the Land Operations Command at Army Headquarters. And he is leading the response to the Ukraine crisis. And he'll provide an overview of Ob Cabret and the operational context. We'll then move to Lieutenant Colonel Rupert Straightfield, who assumed command of the 1st Battalion the Royal Welsh in January 2020 and deployed the one Royal Welsh battle group to Estonia earlier this year. He'll be joined by Corporal Stevens, who's currently on his second operational tour in Estonia, having deployed on Operation Cabrit 2, and Staff Sergeant Jens Holt from the Danish Army, who is deployed to Estonia in March 2022. The format, you'll hear from all of our speakers in turn, and then we'll move to chaired Q&A. And please put your questions in the Zoom Q&A function. Opening remarks for this session are on the record, but Q&A is on off the record. Therefore, if you're watching on YouTube or the RUSI website, you'll have to watch on the Zoom platform to get the Q&A. So firstly, over to Colonel Jerry for the operational context. Thanks, Ed, and good morning. And thank you for inviting me to set the operational context uh, for this talk on uh, Cabrit. Uh, I intend to touch on three key headlines. Uh, firstly, pre-invasion, including our lay down across Europe and the planning that we undertook prior to the 24th of February. Secondly, the invasion itself and the stiff Ukrainian resistance that forced the Russian military to retreat to the eastern and southern parts of Ukraine. And then finally, the British Army's response so far uh, in support of both Ukraine and NATO's eastern flank. So starting with the situation prior to the invasion, at that time, the British Army uh, had a persistent European presence of around 3,000 service personnel, and this was focused on our four main areas of Estonia, uh, Germany, the Balkans, and in Cyprus. And as many as, of, as, many of you will remember, uh, from late 2021, our intelligence organizations began highlighting the growing concern of a large Russian troop buildup just north of the Ukrainian border in Belarus and in southern Russia. And this supposed exercise buildup was noticeably different due to the forward deployment of items such as blood stocks, and mobile crematorium. As a result, since around November last year, we've been developing and executing plans to deliver on four broad indicative effects. Firstly, to better understand and influence the situation through increased information operations. Secondly, to protect the United Kingdom should the situation escalate beyond Ukraine's borders. Thirdly, to reassure our allies and partners by increasing our long range fires, attack helicopters and troop deployments, and in particular, Operation Iron Surge, which you'll hear more about soon. And fourthly, to support the Ukrainians by further enhancing their resistance training through Operation Orbital and the supply of thousands of Javelin and next generation light anti-tank weapons in law, which prior to the invasion was a very sensitive operation. And again, at that time, the military part of the DIME framework was really quite small. The emphasis was rightly on the diplomatic information and economic aspects of the framework, particularly by the threat of sanctions. However, now turning to the invasion and with the world reacting in horror and disbelief, the military emphasis in the dying framework grew. And we all recall the extraordinary Ukrainian defense of Kyiv and how the elite Russian VDV forces who landed at Hostile Airport were defeated. 
and how the 40 kilometer column of Russian armor was halted and forced to retreat. And since then, Russia has become increasingly isolated while NATO has grown in both relevance and in territory, in particular with the imminent addition of Sweden and Finland. And furthermore, following the recent Madrid summit, we're likely to see a generational shift in NATO commitments and presence across the European flank uh, in the East, including a more permanent shift from forward presence to forward defence. Finally, turning to the British Army's response so far, I've touched on the fact that since the invasion, our presence has more than doubled to around 7,000. And when you add our additional surge deployments over the spring and summer, our combat ready presence in Europe peaked at just over 10,000, the highest it's been uh, in many years. Um, and if I could now just invite the team to share the slide titled British Army Activity in Europe, please. So this slide illustrates the key operations to reassure our allies. Most notably is the fact that of our four armoured battle group fleets, three and a quarter of them have been deployed simultaneously in Europe, with a squadron of Challenger 2 main battle tanks in Finland, two armoured battle groups in uh, the Baltics, and a third, our lead armoured battle group, demonstrating across Poland and in Germany. Meanwhile, to the south, 16 Air Assault Brigade Combat Team and United Kingdom attack helicopters projected with our NATO allies to the Balkans in a coordinated series of joint force entry exercises. And in the Ukrainian near abroad, 104 Logistic Brigade have been operating throughout Germany and Poland, coordinating the enormous international effort to support and supply the armed forces of Ukraine. And I think it's worth noting that in addition to the thousands of shoulder-launched anti-tank, anti-aircraft and anti-structure missiles, the United Kingdom has also supplied long-range precision artillery systems, over 100 armoured vehicles, heavy lift drones and many other vital battle-winning assets. And in addition to these efforts on the continent, the British Army is also leading the training of an initial batch of 10,000 new Ukrainian recruits here in the United Kingdom. And this training offers the armed forces of Ukraine with the option to both enhance their national defence and also to consider future counteroffensive. So it is within this context of unprecedented British Army activity that the extraordinary work on Operation Cabrit lies. Thank you for your time. I'll now hand you over to Rue. Thanks, uh, Jerry. So Jerry's given uh, an outline of the sort of strategic operational. What what we'll look to do now is to uh, bring things down into the battle group level, and the way we're going to do that is we're going to is I'm going to talk briefly about the role that we have out here, uh, the structures, uh, a little bit on the ground, uh, and then touch on the overarching theme. And really, that theme is is about being ready. Um, once I've given that introduction, I'll then hand over to Court Stevens uh, and Saf Holtz to look to bring that to life um, from a sort of tactical um, and a personal perspective uh, as a practitioner. Uh, so if we pop to the next slide, uh, please. Our role, put, put simply, is to deter, uh, to reassure and to be prepared to defend. Um, and that that role is uh, unchanged from the last five years um, and being prepared uh, to defend has very much been the focus uh, of preceding battle group commanders. Um, the difference uh, that we've got now with Russia's invasion of Ukraine is it's given very much a, a razor like sort of operational purpose uh, to Kabrit and additional resources. Um, so with that as the role the, the structure over the last five years has been uh, made up of five maneuver subunits and that's been two uk subunits uh, uh, ordinarily a squadron of tanks uh, and an armored infantry company and then a french or danish uh, subunit and then with that there's a slice of combat support engineers and artillery and uh, combat service support capabilities. And that's usually come to about uh, a thousand uh, troops in total uh, across the three nations. What's um, different now as a result of Iron Surge and the uplift is we're a battle group of uh, just over 1300. 
Uh, and that additional uh, e number is made up from surge UK capabilities uh, and an additional French uh, company who've come out uh, with an engineer platoon and a, a commando platoon. Uh, so with that as context on the role and structure, I'd just like to briefly uh, touch on ground. So if you pop to the next uh, slide, I think the, the thing I, I want to emphasize uh, from this is we are a large battle group. You know, 1300 is a lot uh, of troops and a lot of capabilities uh, for one, one battle group to control. But when you actually look at the scale of the ground, um, we are a, a relatively small cog in a much larger uh, machine. So the small blue square you, you can see there is the approximate dimensions of an armoured infantry uh, battle group uh, in defence. Uh, the key point I, I want to highlight here, however, is the fact that we are very mobile uh, and we are held at very high readiness uh, to be able to respond to a range of scenarios uh, in the JOA. Uh, and the key bit is it's not just us. Uh, we are part of a much wider cog within the Estonian Defence Forces. They have a regular uh, regiment uh, called um, the Scouts, and then they have uh, reserves and conscripts. But the ground itself uh, is, is hard ground to soldier, be it dismounted uh, or mounted. There is a considerable amount of uh, boggy, grain that, boggy ground that is restricted uh, to dismounted and mounted forces. Um, and indeed, that's part of a wider NATO uh, machine, be it la land, maritime and air. So with that as a very brief background on the role, uh, the structure and the ground, I'd just like to touch on the overarching theme, and that is about uh, being ready. So if we can pop to the next slide. For me, being ready is about two elements. Um, one is about being able to project rec rapidly, and the second element is about being able to execute the mission. And I'll touch on both uh, first. So projecting rapidly, we received our orders uh, in mid-February for Iron Surge, and Jerry's touched on the wider context for it. Uh, and I'll uh, let Corporal Stevens bring that to life because he was on the operation. But in short, we projected a company group immediately midway through our validation exercise uh, by road to Estonia. Uh, and then the rest of the battle group uh, followed in due course in advance of the timings. Uh, and the thing I'd want to highlight is that uh, projecting uh, an armoured battle group or armoured infantry battle group is never easy. Uh, a mix of wheeled uh, and tracked vehicles comes with a whole load of sort of logistical considerations. Um, but the fact that we did it as a nation at speed so that in advance of the 24th of February is a huge success uh, that we should uh, seek to take forward. The second element of being ready is actually doing something with projecting. So it's the ability to actually execute the mission. And I think that's made up of two elements, which is both integrating and being lethal. So if we pop to the next slide, uh, is just a couple of images from our integration exercise right at the beginning of the tour, where we were bringing together UK, Danish, French and Estonian forces together, looking to understand how that works. And some of that is very basic command and control. Um, some of it is getting uh, beyond technical interoperability challenges. And some of it is, as the top left picture, a picture of, of engineers working out how to do recovery with different capabilities. So there's a lot of considerations to interoperability, and that's why that was my main effort when we first arrived. But the second element uh, of being able to execute the mission is actually being lethal. And if we pop to the next slide, um, what I'd want to emphasize is that the uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has brought a whole load of lessons as to why operating a battle group in the close battle uh, is so vulnerable and how protecting that entity for it to do its job is something uh, that is ignored at people's perils. And the lessons really highlight that well-rehearsed combined arms manoeuvre drills are what are key to improving survivability and lethality. And, and often those drills get referred to as the basics. Um, and really they are um, anything but basic. You know, they require forces to live and train together 
across all opportunities, be it virtual, simulated, um, live, and indeed live firing training to make that work. And that's what we have uh, done out here in Estonia. So with that as a very brief um, uh, introduction, I'll hand over to Court Stevens uh, and Star Stunt Holtz to bring that to life. Next slide. Please. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. That's it. Uh, so I was a member of the battle group uh, that was deployed to um, Senelager in Germany in January of this year. Um, clearly, uh, while we were in Germany, uh, tensions began to rise uh, in the east. Uh, the Russian buildup of forces on the border um, became more and more serious, I think, as we uh, as we sort of in went along with the deployment. Uh, and whereas we thought before, you know, Russia's built up uh, troops on the Ukrainian border um, and saber rattle, you know, we thought that was probably what was going to happen here. It suddenly it became more evident that, you know, they, they may have a, a more nefarious plan in mind. Uh, which obviously led to excitement and uh, uh, nerves because, you know, uh, it could have escalated into a wider conflict. Uh, some context then for the uh, our move on Iron Surge. Uh, the CO addressed the battle group um, just before we deployed into the field um, and, and sort of gave us a, a warning order about the, the escalating situation in the East and, and how it may affect us. Um, obviously, at this point, the media had had also started to uh, get hold of this, and and there was an article in the Sunday Telegraph um, that talked about our deployment. Um, once we deployed into the fields, defence made the decision uh, to deploy a company group uh, by road from Germany to Estonia. Uh, so I left uh, Recce Platoon mid exercise, left them on the range, uh, recovered back to Senelaga camp, and then projected forward. Uh, with the equipment uh, that was then moved by road uh, to Estonia. Uh, that was very complex. It's very complex to move that much heavy equipment across five countries. Uh, and there's there's a definite scale um, to that, which, which I wasn't prepared for. Um, but luckily, we were able to do it at speed. Uh, and I think we really showed there our commitment to NATO and to our NATO allies. Uh, it also underpins for me how important it is for us to have uh, that presence in uh, Germany, in Senelaga, uh, because that allowed us to rapidly project. Um, obviously, as we were moving through, uh, more and more sort of nations were building troops uh, across the whole of uh, the EFP area. And I was actually told uh, we removed SIM cards. We, we were reliant on Wi-Fi. I was actually told about Russia's invasion by American troops uh, that had just arrived in Latvia uh, in a smoking area, uh, which sort of underpinned to me how um, how multinational uh, this response was. Uh, I'll now hand over to Staff Holtz. Thank you. Next slide, please. <clears throat> <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, in Denmark, we, like our British colleagues, were surprised about Russia's invasion. Uh, while we did not deploy early, uh, we did have a lot of exercises just before our deployment, uh, just to make sure we were ready. And uh, also the uh, Danish army uh, decided to uplift their presence in Latvia from May with about uh, 800 people. Uh, just before our deployment, our CEO called us in to inform us uh, that Russia had made it. Ukraine and again everyone was surprised and I think that the uh, Danish outlook and approach to this uh, deployment in Estonia changed from a training mission to something more real. Uh, there was a perception in the uh, company that the deployment to Estonia was going to be like we do at home, train, exercise, shooting ranges, shooting ranges. Uh, but when uh, Russia invaded uh, it changed the attitude and the approach to the mission uh, of course, we are doing those things over here, but uh, this is about NATO unity and reassuring allies to ensure Russia does not try anything here. Uh, we have to remember we are only about 900 kilometers away from my home in Denmark. And uh, unlike you guys, we don't have the uh, English channel. Uh, this deployment is uh, different from my experience to, in Iraq for obvious reasons, the threat being the uh, biggest difference. Uh, but I think the consequences of if the threat materializes here, it's uh, far worse than it ever could be in uh, Iraq. 
uh, if we don't get this right, I think the consequences will be unimaginable and will change Europe. Uh, I'll now hand back to Corporal Stevens, who would outline uh, experiences on our abilities to execute the mission. Thank you. Uh, so, um, being ready uh, and being ready to uh, execute our mission here, uh, we've had some challenges, uh, but lots of positive experiences. Uh, so, starting with some of the positives, I think based uh, this time on on Cabrit Ten versus when I deployed on Cabrit Two, um, the whole context of the operation has changed in the minds of people that are here. Uh, this time, obviously, there's a much more present threat than there was on Cabrit 2. And I think as well, the Army's uh, mindset has changed. We've moved away from counterinsurgency operations in Afghanistan, Iraq and uh, Syria. And now um, we are looking towards a more conventional sphere. Uh, I also think there's, there's a deep level of trust now between uh, the British and the Estonians. We've been working together for five years. Um, and, and whereas it was a fairly new thing on Cabrit 2, uh, I think now it's really developed in, into a partnership. Um, and, you know, that, that threat element, um, you know, most people thought that Russia wouldn't invade Ukraine. Uh, they did. And that shows us now that the rules have clearly changed. Uh, and it's clear to me and to everyone here that the Estonians keenly feel a threat that's posed by Russia. Um, and it's something that I think we... Unless you've been here, you'll struggle to understand because you don't think of it at home in the UK, but they definitely do think of it here. Uh, there have inevitably been some challenges with executing our mission. Um, I think we can learn the lessons from Ukraine and we see how challenging it is to do war fighting and to do war fighting well. Um, counterinsurgency operations are one thing. However, war fighting it is a different beast and there's definitely uh, a lot more danger and a lot more um, sort of weight behind war fighting operations. Uh, but that's that's taught us two major lessons. Firstly, we need to get the basics right. And secondly, it takes time to scale up to brigade and battle group uh, level operations. So across the battle group, we focused on our low level skills and drills. Uh, Ukraine has, has definitely taught us that there isn't one silver bullet that's going to affect uh, a victory for us. We need to master uh be masters of, uh, of our trade uh it's also good because we don't have the multiple commitments that we have in the uk out here so it allows us to get together as a battle group and, and really focus in on our training um you know and we can also look to the lessons of ukraine poor camouflage and concealment uh being found both visually and electromagnetically uh have, have also you know been been key things we've been working on while we've been out here um, as you know, you can see the pictures there. Um, we've also experimented with our I-Star group. Um, you know, we've trained more assault pioneers uh, to put in the back of reconnaissance vehicles, uh, which has allowed us better mobility and counter mobility. We've also put javelin dismounts in the back of our recce vehicles, increasing our lethality. And we've enhanced our sniper platoon with uh, manned aerial systems and quad bikes uh, so they can find the enemy and, and be less detectable. The second real challenge to our mission out here is the training at scale. Um, it's difficult in the UK to train at scale, and it's difficult to get the whole battle group together to train at that scale. Um, out here, it's been uh, a lot better. We have things like Exercise Hedgehog, which involved 15,000 Estonian troops and nine nations uh, on public and private land. And that's probably the closest to war fighting operations I've ever come to uh, as a training mission. It was, it was really, really good. Um, and you don't get opportunities like that in the UK. Uh, you know, you're operating in actual towns and villages with people in their gardens or going to work and you're driving around in your warrior looking for enemy positions. Um, it really is. It really is something uh, that's awesome. And it also adds a level of complexity that you just can't get on a UK training area. We did one operation uh, to take a bridge uh, and assault into an urban area. And the Viking company had come forward uh, started to clear through a wood block. I then had to echelon through them um, and then liaise with our B company and bring them forward, set, having set the conditions and launching them onto a position uh, with a river crossing. Uh, you know, that sort of complexity is not something you find on uh, British training areas. And it was really, really good 
uh, to do. Uh, I'll now hand back to Staff Holtz. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so from uh, my perspective, we had a number of successes and challenges as well. Uh, one of the challenges is maintaining a clear focus on why we're deployed. Uh, and operating with our allies uh, helps a lot. And also doing these outreaches in Estonia and meeting the Estonian people uh, helps give purpose to the mission on uh, why we're here. And seeing how much it means, our presence to the civilians is a big morale booster and gives us that extra mental motivation to stay focused. Uh, linked to this is the uh, chance of replicating the realities of fighting at scale. It's difficult to stress the lo logistical chain, the medical chain, and the equipment repair chain back in Denmark. Uh, it's also difficult to get the scale into the heads of the uh, soldiers and what it means to them. And operating here in Estonia gives us that e opportunity to get better at fighting at scale. For example, on the uh, Hedgehog uh, exercise where two full brigades were fighting each other at a free play uh, scenario. And another chance we have here in the battle group, and one that is replicated across NATO, is interoperability. So working uh, with partner nations still poses a number of problems due to our language, uh, culture, and histories. I think that fundamentally we still learn the uh, same NATO standard drills, but this is more of a question of do we have the same uh, understanding of it. Uh, so when we did the Hedgehog, my platoon was tasked to protect a, bit, a bridge while a, a UK reggae team was preparing uh, the bridge to be blown up. Although I have tried this uh, back home in Denmark with the Danish teams, uh, this was my first time with another nation. So just making sure what was expected of one another and now have done this, I believe uh, makes us much more lethal. On the uh, human side, uh, we in the Danish army are reaping the uh, benefits of years of working uh, or fighting alongside UK forces, be it in Iraq or Afghanistan. Culturally, we understand British, you uh, British uh, well, and uh, while there might be a slight difference in uh, terminology or doctrine, I think fundamentally we are similar. We still employ fire and movements and many of our SOPs are more or less the same. Uh, we have seen that on numerous exercises we have conducted together. And once we overcome the technical challenges, we uh, work well together. Technical interoperability, I believe, still needs uh, some improvements, and we struggle to communicate without adding more and more nets. Uh, on the modern battlefield, that makes us uh, vulnerable. Uh, while we always work a solution around the problem, it's not reliable, nor does it give us the quality communication we strive for. Still, I think there will always be a requirement for liaison officers. Uh, with so many uh, nationalities within NATO, there will always be a need for translation, especially with the uh, different UK accents and slang. I'll now hand over to the CEO. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so um, it, just in summary, really, I think the, the key theme we've, we've, we've wanted to bring out is the importance um of being ready uh, and what i hope is that the observations uh from Corporal stevens and staff holtz uh in the components of that of projecting rapidly and being able to execute the mission uh, have been useful for all other speakers i think the, the point i would want to to bring out in summary is that highlighting the significance of the ability to be able to support uh, support political intent with the military capability at a point of need. Uh, and it feels, as we reflect on the last five months, uh, that Iron Surge uh, and the projected deployment of the EFP Battle Group are a great uh, example of that. Um, so with that, uh, as a sort of summary, I think I'll pass back now to Ed and we'll look forward to taking any questions that you have. Thank you, Colonel, and thank you to all of our speakers for a very interesting discussion. We'll move straight into the Q&A now. Just as a reminder, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function, and the Q&A is now off the record. <laughs> 